Welcome good people, my name is Joel Collier and today we're going to talk about the different models that you can encounter in Sim and just kind of explain each one of those to give you a little better understanding moving forward with your own analysis. So the first one we're going to talk about is the measurement model. So the measurement model is really looking at the analysis properties within constructs. Uh, so did you measure these constructs properly? So in this example right here, uh, I've got three unobservable variables or variables that I really can't observe. Uh, that's why they call them unobservable, which is adaptive behavior, customer delight, and word of mouth. Well, how do you capture these unobservables? Well, usually we're asking like survey questions. So in this instance, adaptive behavior, I had five survey questions. Uh, listed as adapt one through five. Customer delight had three survey questions and then word of mouth had three survey questions. And so those squares, if you will, are the observables that are supposed to capture the unobservable construct itself uh, in our model. Well, the measurement properties, what it's doing is looking really within each construct, did you measure it properly? So with each one of those uh, items with adaptive behavior, is it capturing the unobservable construct? You know, is it, are those items, you know, consistent? Is there validity in the standpoint? Do they all kind of converge on that concept? And is it discriminant from others, maybe even similar uh, unobservable concepts that are there? Um, when you're assessing a measurement model too, um, SIM treats all of your unobservables as independence. You notice that there's no kind of paths going from one construct to the other. We're not looking at structural paths between constructs at this point. We're just looking within. And so Amos treats all of them as independents. And thus, all independent constructs in SIM have a covariance between, um, between those constructs. And so you can see there's a covariance listed across all three of those, customer delight, word of mouth, and adaptive behavior. And so again, at this point, we're just trying to assess, you know, did I capture the unobservable construct with my measures? And that's really kind of the measurement model. Now, the next model that you might encounter is what's called a path model. So once you've kind of established your measurement properties, now you're looking to determine what we call structural paths or paths between constructs. So we're not looking within anymore. Now we're looking across constructs to say, well, does one construct influence another one? Um, and in a path model, what it does is it basic, basically takes your unobservable construct uh, and it converts it into kind of a composite score. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, basically what it does is it takes the, the score, like for instance with this adaptive behavior, we've got five items that have measured it. Well, it will take the score for each one of those and then it'll just take an average of it. Uh, so instead of having five different scores for adaptive behavior, it basically comes up with one score, the average of it. And now you can notice that it's not an unobservable, it treats it as an observable. Uh, and what a path model does is it takes all those measurement properties uh, and, and creates kind of this composite score and then it really just looks at the relationships across constructs. The downside of this is, is you're ignoring one of the, the biggest strengths of SIM which is that it assesses measurement error uh, and can account for that kind of variance. Well, you're not really doing that when you get into the path model. Uh, and this is very similar to how you even see kind of regression done. It does a very similar way in that it kind of creates these kind of composite variables. And this is kind of typically what you would see with a path model here. You can see the beginning of all my constructs have a comp for composite variable. You know, adaptive behavior, you know, has a relationship to delight. And then delight has a relationship to word of mouth. Again, I'm not looking at any of the properties that within each of those. I'm only looking at the relationships across those uh, those constructs and that's what we call kind of a path model now you've also got what's called a full structural model which to be honest with you is really a better alternative than a path model and what the full structural model does is it includes 
not only the measurement properties within each construct, but it also includes the paths across constructs in this model. So now not only are we assessing all of the measurement properties of like adaptive behavior and the error terms within each one of those items, but now I'm also assessing its relationship across constructs too. Again, you know, adaptive behavior leading to customer delight and word of mouth. In this instance, you're going to explain way more of the variance because you're accounting for error in the measurement uh, items. And it's by far the most um, optimal way to kind of run a model in sim. It's a little bit more laborious because you got to, you know, keep everything kind of in the model. It's not as simple as a path model, but oftentimes you'll find you'll get a little uh, more optimal results this way because again you're explaining more variance. The other model that you can run into is what's called a mediation model. Um, and so what this does is let's say you have a predictor such as adaptive behavior uh, and you think well adaptive behavior is going to influence word of mouth uh, but you also might think that maybe it actually has its influence through kind of a third party or a third, con uh, third construct. So in this instance you're trying to assess kind of the mediation properties. Uh, does it mediate through something else to word of mouth? So in this instance, you can see by the model, I've got adaptive behavior going to customer delight and then delight to word of mouth. So I'm assessing, is customer delight a mediator of adaptive behavior to word of mouth? And uh, it really kind of follows that indirect kind of path so I'm assessing the indirect effect and I'm also assessing the direct effect to see um, if both are significant or maybe even one. Now with this mediation model right here, I've only really got one mediator. But what if I had multiple mediators too? So the term is called a parallel mediation model. So in this instance, I've still got one predictor variable that adaptive behavior, but now it goes to two kind of different constructs that are acting as kind of mediating properties. One is that still customer delight going to word of mouth, but I also got another one in here now, which is like gratitude perceptions. Um, and so, you know, one of the things too that you're uh, going to have to kind of assess now is not only the mediation for each uh, kind of path, the, each one of those indirect effects. And that's the reason why it's called parallel, because it kind of splits, if you will. And now you're assessing, does the indirect effect go through customer delight, but also does the indirect effect go through gratitude perceptions? And do both of those, you know, lead to word of mouth? The other kind of serial, um, uh, other type of mediation that you might run into is what's called serial mediation. And in this instance, you have multiple mediators in kind of a path or a chain. Sometimes you hear it referred to as a chain mediation, where in this instance, you've got adaptive behavior leading to customer delight. And then that mediator leads to another media possible mediator, gratitude perceptions, if it was modeled this way, and then to word of mouth. So it's actually mediating through multiple mediators. Uh, and that's what we call kind of serial mediation. The other kind of model that you can run into with Amos uh, and even just Sim in general is what they call higher order models. Uh, and what this is, is usually you've got uh, some unobservable constructs that will form kind of this higher order kind of concept. So here's an example of what this uh, might look like. So if I was trying to capture the term uh, unique experience or how, how unique was the experience that you had and this was like from a restaurant setting. And then I might say, well, unique experience is really made up of other constructs. It's like surprise. Like, were they really surprised when they came in there? Oh, that was really unique. Or maybe it was empathy, you know? So maybe they're very empathetic to me in my situation. And I had like six kids and they were, I could tell things were going crazy. And, then, you know, it was just kind of a unique experience. I went and got it somewhere else. And so uh, in that instance, you have these kind of constructs that form kind of a higher order concept. And usually they'll term that uh, the higher order, the, the, the one that, uh, that's kind of being encompassed by this, they'll call it a second order construct. Sometimes you'll refer to, they'll refer to it as a higher order construct, but probably you'll hear it more often used as a second order construct, which is being formed by 
first order constructs, so constructs that are at the very kind of first level. So in this instance, surprise and empathy would be first order constructs, and the unique experience would be a second order uh, construct. Uh, the other thing too that you'll see, even especially with higher order models, is you'll see the term uh, formative versus reflective uh, different models too. In this instance, when you have a path that goes uh, to an unobservable, uh, you're talking about those being what they call formative. Uh, and then when you have paths, you know, coming from the unobservable, maybe to observables or indicators, well, they would call that reflective then. And so you can have formative models and you can also have reflective models uh, that are uh, in SIM. And in each one of those, it's just, again, a matter of um, which way the path is going. And there's a lot of uh, description that kind of goes into what, what equates to a reflective model and what equates to a formative model. And I've got a whole separate video that just kind of talks about when you should use each of those. Um, but in, you know, kind of formative models, you can see that the error is really assessed kind of on the unobservable, you know, kind of level at the top, where in a reflective model, uh, the error is really assessed on the indicators or the measurement properties on the individual level too for each one. And so it's a little different uh, from each perspective. And so from that standpoint, I, I, this is just kind of a, uh, a quick overview of different type of models that you'll see uh, in SIM. If you're looking for more information on how to uh, run these models, different models in Amos, I'd encourage you to check out my book, Applied Structural Equation Modeling Using Amos. Uh, and as always, uh, if you saw value uh, in this video, I would ask you to like and subscribe uh, for more videos to come. Uh, I hope you all have a great week good people.